Welcome to yet another lecture. Our topic today is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, otherwise known as ALS. So the definition of ALS, um, Greek word, and if you kind of break it down from the beginning, A for without, myo, muscle, tropic, nourishment, lateral, looking at the lateral area of the spinal cord, and sclerosis, a hardening of the uh, motor neurons, must, much like arteriosclerosis, a hardening of the arteries. So who gets ALS? Well, 5,600 people diagnosed every year. Um, that's almost 15 cases a day. What are some risk factors for ALS? 60% of ALS victims are male, 93% Caucasian. So there is some genetic risk there and probably also some environmental exposure linked to pesticides, lead, uh, factory chemicals, living near mills or plants, and then veterans of the Gulf War are, have a two, two times higher risk than the normal population. Uh, most ALS victims are between the ages of 40 to 70. It would be rare that it was younger in their 20s and 30s. So the pathophysiology of ALS does seem to have um, some genetic component, some gene mutation component. Um, and what they have found is that there's a definite chemical imbalance. So here we're talking about glutamate. Glutamate is the brain's main excitatory neurotransmitter. So when you have glutamate excitotoxicity, there is too much glutamate. There's an overabundance and it builds up around the cells and it causes them to constantly be excited, to constantly fire. And obviously if they keep firing uh, more than they should, they're just gonna poop out and eventually die. So this um, constant overfiring caused by excess glutamate can lead to actually cell degeneration and cell death. This is an autoimmune response. Um, this is kind of a disorganized immune response. Macrophages and T cells are attacking the healthy neurons. Um, cells are not getting the protein they need and eventually they will die. So nursing assessment, what are we going to see at the bedside? Probably a pretty subtle onset. We'll have to do a good HPI history of presenting illness, good HPI of the symptoms. You may see some tongue atrophy, some trouble speaking or a little bit of slurring of words, some weakness of hands and arms seems to start in the upper extremities. Beginning muscular atrophy of the arms, you may actually see that muscle mass change. If you remember during PA, PA exam, you um, have studied fasciculation of the tongue. And here you might see fasciculations of the face, so a twitching, um, certainly not uh, controlled, of the face. The speech quality changes, gets more nasal and characteristic, almost like the lower tones drop out of that speech. You, um, again, might have dysarthria or this difficulty with speech, slurred speech. Dysphagia, um, difficulty swallowing. Fatigue while talking, you'll notice people stopping, um, having to rest, take a breath, and then continue talking. Limb symptom onset. 80% of patients uh, permit with asymmetric limb weakness. Um, that's probably the most common, well, it is the most common form of ALS, or you could have a bulbar onset, and this would be a brainstem onset, and this is where the speech changes would kind of present first, which makes sense, right, closer to the brain versus presenting in the limbs. Bulbar onset, if, if that's what you're distinguishing, usually has a faster onset than limb onset ALS. So away from the bedside, what are we going to diagnose test-wise? Well, um, trying to uh, correlate those symptoms with something, probably do an EMG, which is an electrical muscle conduction test, seeing if those muscles are conducting normally or are they truly overexcited perhaps. Nerve conduction test, same thing. Possibly a muscle biopsy, looking for um, abnormalities in proteins and whatnot. Uh, also, maybe a disease of exclusion, looking at an MRI, spinal tap, or even some blood panels to see if we can exclude anything else, uh, infection, um, or so on. So overall symptoms of ALS. Some overall symptoms of ALS. Since you have degeneration at the neuronal level, you, um, especially the upper motor neurons, you'll see that hyperreflexia, that spasticity. Um, as well as some weakness. If you have lower motor neuron involvement, um, brainstem involvement, you may see the weakness, uh, muscle atrophy, and here's where the fasciculation may come in. 
So ALS attacks your motor neurons only, which means that the other stuff is all intact. Your intelligence, your sight, your taste, hearing, touch, and smell, all those senses are intact. It is a muscle and nerve degeneration. Muscles of the eyes and bladder are generally not affected. You don't see that, you know, incontinence necessarily. Later symptoms of ALS include advancing atrophy of the affected areas. Um, advancing atrophy of the thoracic muscles, the trapezius sternocleidomastoid muscles. Uh, you can imagine this is getting a little closer to having trouble with breathing, and that's where a lot of our intervention is going to be focused. Respiratory muscle weakness um, does, of course, lead to respiratory compromise, where you may need nighttime support, uh, and then eventual dependency, where you may be trait, vented, and so on. Because of this respiratory involvement, you may get a resultant pneumonia. Um, this could also lead to uh, overwhelming infection um, and treatment for ALS. There is no cure for ALS. You're all familiar with Ice Bucket Challenge. That was, 2000 and, was it 2015. Uh, really popular to raise money for this awful disease. And um, treatment is really aimed at maximizing independence, maximizing um, quality of life, but there is no cure. And that money is going towards hoping to find a cure. There is one medication that we can give, uh, one medication only, and that's Rilotec or Rilazole. This seems to help with that glutamate. It seems to reduce some of the um, glutamate amount, and that's normally, of course, uh, at presenting in higher levels with people with ALS. So Rilazole or Rilazole may cause some side effects, may have dizziness, uh, liver function changes, so you have to really balance the side effects with possible um, improvement in muscle control. So if we can't cure the underlying disease, we're going to treat a lot of symptoms, and this is where multiple meds are going to come in. You can kind of brainstorm for yourself here what meds might you expect uh, for a patient with ALS. Well, muscle spasms, you may have a muscle relaxant. Um, spasticity, same thing. Um, constipation, obviously, the colase, the senas, and whatnot, changing up diet, fluids. Fatigue, uh, excessive fatigue, you may actually find your patients with a bit of a stimulant uh, to keep them awake during the daytime, for example. Excessive salivation, think about something to dry up some of those secretions, like aroxanol. Excessive phlegm, same thing. Pain, definitely want pain control. Um, good pain control, uh, sustained pain control. Depression, this is a chronic illness with a 100% fatality rate, um, I think, pretty much. So uh, treating this depression and being proactive about that. Um, fatigue's on here twice, probably just a hammer at home, so there you go, freebie from me to you. Uh, sleep problems, if, you know, people aren't able to sleep, we might think about a sleep aid. Um, and then there's some mood and affect um, lability here. Um, uncontrolled outbursts of laughing or crying. I don't know that we're really going to treat that, but certainly to recognize that as part of the disease process. So think about using your interprofessional team, respiratory therapy, respiratory care, especially if your patient is at home on a, ventil on a uh, ventilator. A lot of you doing your home care rotations have noticed that respiratory might be involved as a service with your home care folks. Physical therapy to Learn, uh, probably even early on with the disease, learning how to use adaptive devices, how to use a walker, how to use a cane, how to use hand splints, um, and then later to maintain strength and maintain quality of life. We want to consult our nutritionists to not only uh, have the proper nutrients, but also to think about food texture and quality, consistency of foods um, as this uh, muscle control uh, worsens. We're definitely going to have to change up diet. Occupational therapy, same thing, um, thinking about adaptive driving, um, ways to perform ADLs, get around the house, open cabinets, all those things um, to preserve quality of life. And then speech therapy may be involved to actually switch over to what control is left, if it's voice control, if it's um, a computer to speak, a computer to write, and some adaptive devices for communication. So ALS prognosis, very, very sad. There are no current treatments or therapies that have been shown to even slow the progression of the disease. We are really treating symptoms, and that disease is going to go on regardless.
Life expectancy with ALS, three to five years. Uh, it is rare to live past 10 years. 90% of ALS diagnoses actually have an unknown pathophysiology, so it's difficult to treat a disease if you can't determine a root cause, say the chemical or the exposure or the genetic link or the mutation. If, if you can't get a handle on that, um, it's really uh, hard to drive the research in the right direction. Priority nursing problems with ALS. Um, we've talked several times about preserving respiratory function, protecting and supporting respiratory effort. Along with that, we um, have risk for aspiration. We have definitely impaired swallowing and so on. Skin integrity, losing muscle tone, becoming bed bound and all the things that go with that. Pain and not able to move um, and certainly uh, want to control pain as much as possible. Safety. Imbalanced nutrition, we've mentioned, getting our dietitians involved. Psychosocial with the obvious depressive component. There's a risk for suicide here. There's a risk for suicide early on, actually, as people realize what their course of disease may turn into. Um, chronic sorrow, not only for the patient, but for the caregivers watching this happen around them. And then almost like a, a preemptive death anxiety. Um, predicting the outcome of this disease is unfortunately a reality. Impaired verbal communication, especially in later stages of the disease, some things that we can help with, again, those adaptive devices from speech pathology, um, computers, and so on, as I mentioned. Okay, there's a couple videos here on this slide. Uh, total five minutes, great videos to watch. One is a Gulf War veteran who contracted ALS after serving two tours in the Gulf War and he was um, working on fighter planes in the Air Force and now he is bed bound. Um, the other is uh, Barry Winovich and he's actually been a huge fundraiser, huge proponent for ALS research. Really encourage you to watch these videos. Um, they'll be broken out in our course site as well so you may want to come back to that. Five minutes total, it's worth it. It's worth it to hear their stories. Okay, what's new in ALS? Well, stem cells, uh, if we can provide some new cells that will not be, um, of course, corrupted. That would be great. Um, aglionucleotide therapy is, is another type of therapy. Human growth hormone replacement therapy, trying to get at some of these um, processes and replace the bad parts, basically. Gene mutation, uh, if there is a gene mutation, can we actually physically go in and alter it or block it? Um, the ice bucket challenge we mentioned, this was um, 2014, I see here. and really did create a lot of awareness, but you can see for yourself how was that campaign sustained? How are we doing a couple of years later? No White Flags is another huge um, public awareness uh, campaign. This was really popular on Twitter, and this was to, su uh, to support and give ALS patients to guarantee them communicative devices such as computers and whatnot um, without having to go through insurance companies, that it would just be a guaranteed um, part of their treatment. Okay, so here is a picture of um, Steve Gleason. Uh, the Steve Gleason Act did support the No White Flags campaign to cover speech generating devices, and he himself, professional football player um, for the Saints, did actually have Z's as well. So some questions for you. Here's um, an ALS question number one. If you are the registered nurse and you are providing education to a patient and family with ALS, which of the following would you like to include? Which would you include to educate the patient and family? Select all that apply. The danger of select all that applies. So number one, a progressive disease involving the motor system. Two, the cause is mostly unknown. Three, memory loss is gradual and occurs in every patient. Four, the progression of the disease is slow. Death is usually in the 15 to 20 years. Five, currently no cure. Or six, treatment is rilozole or rilotec helpful in repairing damaged motor neurons? Well, number one, yep. Number two, yep. Number three, well, we didn't talk at all about memory loss, so that's not it. It's not a, a you know, a dementia type disease or anything like that. The progression of the disease is slow, death in 15 to 20 years? Nope, not number four. Three to five years with not a lot of people living past 10. So I would actually say the progression is pretty darn fast. Currently no cure, yep. And then uh, Rylazole, Rylatec is one of our only medical treatments. Good, okay. 
Um, question number two, testing your knowledge on ALS. What would a registered nurse expect to observe while taking care of a patient newly diagnosed with ALS? Would you have changes in vision and hearing, headaches with nausea, tongue atrophy, dysphagia, neurogenic bladder, and bowel incontinence? Just one correct answer here, and that's letter C, tongue atrophy and dysphagia.